Uh, our panelists are Ambassador Bubakar Burema, the permanent representative of Niger, and Ambassador Ahmadou Old Abdullah, the executive director of the Centre for S in Nawakchat, Mauritania. I really want to thank them also for joining us today. Um, as you have noted in this program, uh, Yusuf Mahmoud on the right, our senior advisor at IPI, will offer his thoughts on the way forward after this discussion. Uh, the objective of today's meeting is uh, to share with you the substantive results of the seminar which the government of Niger, together with Centre 4S and IPI, convened in Niamey on February 15, uh, 16, uh, just over a month ago. And that seminar uh, provided a unique opportunity uh, to bring together local and regional leaders, representatives of civil society, and experts from regional research organizations to share their perceptions and understanding of the major challenges in the Sahel-Sahara region and to suggest ways for addressing these challenges. The seminar also provided an opportunity for the government of Niger to present its national security, its strategy, its national strategy for security and development in the Sahel-Sahara zones, which it had officially launched already in October 2012. Um, Romano Prodi, Saad Jinnit, and Pierre Boyoya, uh, who are special envoys of the United Nations and the African Union, uh, were present and provided their perspectives. They and the other participants offered elements for a strategy to address in a sustainable manner the multiple faceted problems affecting the Sahel Sahara region. As you're all aware the United Nations is developing its strategy to address the multiple political, security, and humanitarian challenges in the Sahel-Sahara region. And Luxembourg is currently on the Security Council and is thus playing an important role together with other member states in helping shape this strategy. So we're going to begin with our panelists, and I would like first to give the floor to Ambassador Luke Lucas, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hirsch, Ambassador Buraima, Ambassador Ult Abdallah, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's certainly a great honor for me to open um, this uh, policy forum devoted to the Sahel Sahara region, and which will look at uh, how to implement uh, ideas that have been put forward a month ago at the International Seminar on Security and Development held in Niamey, Niger, on 15 and 16 February 2013, uh, as Ambassador Hirsch just um, recalled. And Luxembourg is proud to have been uh, among the supporters of this seminar, um, along with other counties, Finland, the Netherlands, Norway, and the Francophonie. And um, I really would like um, to thank all the organizers, especially IPI, uh, for hosting us today in order to follow up on this seminar, and I think that's most uh, appropriate. Um, as, as you all know, I think this forum could not come at a more timely moment. Um, and, and since our last discussion, last seminar on this subject here in, in, um, in New York in September, the situation in Sahel, in the Sahel region, has drastically evolved. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, immediate attention of the international community has lately been focused on the situation in Mali, um, following the worsening of the security situation and, and the push of armed terrorist groups uh, towards Bamako. France launched, as you know, a military intervention on the 11th of January at the request of the Malian authorities. Um, this development has... Uh, prompted the accelerated deployment of African troops in the framework of the African-led international support mission to Mali, AFISMA, and currently, as you might also know, the Security Council is considering um, turning AFISMA in a UN stabilization mission once conditions uh, on the ground uh, allow for such a reheading. Um, and we are currently waiting for the report uh, by ASG Mule, who was last week in, in Mali, to have talks um, with all the partners involved and to make recommendations to this effect. But if we pause for a second and take a look at um, the wider perspective, um, we must recognize that the crisis in Mali exemplifies 
albeit in a very extreme fashion, the much wider crisis and engulfing the whole Sahel region. Um, as we all know, the Sahel faces simultaneously the challenges of extreme poverty, the effects of climate change, frequent food crisis, rapid population growth, fragile governance, corruption, unresolved internal uh, tensions, the rise of violent extremism and radicalization, illicit transnational uh, trafficking and cross-border terrorist activities. The combination of all these factors and its wide-ranging consequences creates a multidimensional crisis that poses a threat not only to regional stability but also to international peace and security. Uh, in Mali, like uh, in a perfect storm, these factors came together and generated a crisis a situation which could only be tackled by um, strong steps such as the ones taken by France to this day in the framework of its several military op operation in support of the Malian armed forces. The states of the region are directly confronted, and Ambassador Hirschel pointed to that, with this multitude of challenges. And these challenges all have an essential transport or component. Thus, only a regional, integrated, and global strategy will provide us with the necessary framework of action to address all these intrinsic, intrinsic vulnerabilities. Straits of the region must be put at the heart of this strategy, and they have to strengthen their capacities in the areas of security and at the same time improve accountable institutions capable of providing basic services to their citizens and reducing internal tensions. Socioeconomic development, in particular through the promotion of youth employment, improved governance, and the enhancement of the security situation are all, in our view, key to achieve the durable stability of the region. And a better cooperation between the states of the region is also necessary. Luxembourg believes that a truly comprehensive approach is urgently needed. And we are, of course, not alone in our belief. <clears throat> Indeed, many member states have been urging the United Nations, through the Special Envoy of the Secretary General Romano Prodi, to design and implement a genuinely integrated regional strategy for the Sahel. And as you might recall, last December, under Moroccan Presidency of the Security Council, um, there was also a debate at the level of security on the, on the Sahel, and it was entitled Sahel towards a more comprehensive and coordinated approach. Uh, you might also know that the European Union has adopted already in September 2011 um, an integrated strategy for the Sahel, very much based on this belief also that security and development have to, to go together. So we keep calling at every possible uh, consultation in the Council, I can tell you, uh, on the Secretary to finalize this strategy because we trust that such a strategy um, by making full use of the UN toolbox, by bringing together all the relevant UN activities peace and security, development, human rights, that such a strategy will help foster a joint UN approach across the different departments, strengthen coordination among international actors, and provide, and that I think is the most important point, better support to the states of the region. To conclude my remarks, I would like to stress that the um, Security Council is extremely concerned by the prevailing situation in the Sahel, and um, the Again, the crisis in Mali shows us how quickly a fragile state can in turn into a state on the verge of collapse or take over by terrorist groups. And this region situation requires an urgent, coordinated and determined action by all stakeholders in the region with the strong and united support of the international community. And I very much hope that today's discussion will help identify ways to achieve this aim. And I wish all participants a very fruitful lunchtime session. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Lucas. Well, many of you here will recall that we had an initial discussion of this topic on September 7 of last year with essentially the same people that you see here. So I'm very pleased to introduce our partner uh, from the Centre for S, Ambassador Amadou Old Abdullah, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you to the pleasure, and uh, I would like to thank the government of Niger and the uh, government of uh, Luxembourg for having supported uh, uh, the work we have done. 
quickly, uh, I think it is very important to put the crisis in Mali in the context of Sahel and uh, West Africa. In the 90s, it was Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire. So uh, I'm not saying it is the same thing, but uh, the Sahel has been fragile. Second, because a number of considerations, drug, diplomatic competition in the region, we and Islamist or whatever traffic and so on, we cannot exclude comparing to Somalia and uh, uh, Afghanistan. Um, more observation. The crisis has been identified in 2003 when the U.S. government launched the Pan-Sahel Initiative. Then the Trans-Sahara Counter-Terrorism Partnership. And it didn't move. So all the problem, but for a number of reasons, we didn't move forward. Why this crisis? First, inconsistent governance, what we used to say bad governance, inconsistent governance, which means neglect of youth and uh, no hope to get a job. And again, this is not new. UN has written an issue paper in 2006, 2005, you know, thousands of exemplars in UNOWA on youth and employment as a threat. Traffic in the drug and cigarette and migrant worker with a huge amount of money. You know, a kilogram of cocaine in Latin America is between 2,000 and 3,000. When it comes to West Africa, it is already 6,000. In, 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 uh, in the capital in Sahel, it is 13,000. In the capital in Maghreb, it is 20 something thousand. When it comes to Europe, it is $45,000. So it is a huge business, and we should not just focus Islamist collapse and so on. It is also a big business. Why do we have these radicals? They were mostly in Algeria, and they have been pushed south, which for reason we understand. But uh, they became a problem, and they pushed for the trade, migrant worker, cigarette, drug, as mentioned, and so on. And other causes, among the causes, is lack of cooperation, especially between Algeria, Libya, and Morocco. We cannot have peace if a major country in the north do not connect, not one by one, but connect with sub-Saharan Africa. And this sub-Saharan Africa should connect with the Benin state, the Gulf of Guinea. But as long as we don't have this connection, and I don't know how we'll have it, it is part of a problem. So competition, lack of understanding between the Maghreb state and between them and uh, sub-Saharan Africa. It reminds almost like in Afghanistan, where India, Iran, and Pakistan are playing around Afghanistan. Everyone is paying and so on. And other things is Libyan crisis. I, I know everyone would like to say Libyan crisis is for causes. No, Libyan crisis was only a trigger. The crisis was there since the 70s. You know, people have been recruited to fight with uh, late Gaddafi, and, and he was investing. So, because I need more time for a question, I, I will just mention the name. The, the Libyan crisis was only the trigger. So these people are trying to shift the blame for bad governance, for exclusion, it is a problem. And if youth are in violence because being terrorist gives you a prestige, gives you a revenue, when you have no chance, if you are not from the right ethnic group, to, 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 to get it. Now, new development, a French response. I don't call it an intervention. I think French responded to a brutal threat on the capital. So it is a response, as they did in my own country when the Polisario almost took over Mauritania, as they did in Chad when, in '84, the Gaddafi troop almost took over, as the British did with force commander in Sierra Leone in 2002, when you know, a group tried to, to take over. 
today we have a, a number uh, uh, and other issues we should not ignore, humanitarian assistance and the human rights violation. They are serious issues. They are connected to inner war. The problem with the military intervention, people will not blame the author, but will blame the major country. Oh, if it were not French troops, we would not have it. So I, I think one of the most unintended consequences is that people will criticize France for any violation of human rights. This being said, what next? What to do? It, to me, it is what to avoid. You know, we have to avoid the Sahel issue becoming an international item on international debate. We are not looking for a solution, but we are trying to discuss it. And this is the biggest threat, I told my Malian friend and, and all of us, because I am from a border <coughs> country. Uh, uh, my country in Mauritania, we are bordering uh, Mali, and uh, it is a threat. So the real problem, if we'd like to help, is Bamako itself. As long as we don't have a credible, accepted, able to deliver government in Bamako, we are going almost nowhere. And it is very important. We, you know, people would like to decide to, to have an election, but to me, a solution is still possible through a credible government. If not, the agenda will be hijacked by all of us having a meeting on children in conflict, meeting on women in conflict, meeting on humanitarian assistance, you know, the, the traditional things. And, and it is going to be very difficult. The external response or intervention, Chadian and, and the French, uh, how to discuss it, it is there. The problem is how to address unintended consequences. And it is not going to, to be easy in a region where people like to fight. You know, in, uh, and so another point, what happened to Mali, I think it is good to remind, it could have happened to any of the other countries. M Mali collapsed. It could have been any Sahelian countries. What to do? It's, it should be a wake-up call to all these governments to be more inclusive. It is not enough to be elected. You have to be also legitimate. And if not, you know, UN and major countries like US, France, UK, you know, our friend in the region, whatever their influence, and they still have a great influence, if they don't encourage, like in Niger, consensual government, consultation between opposition and government, we are for more trouble. But to say, I'm elected, I don't talk to you, what elected? Even during time war, you know, people have inclusive government. Even Obama took a Republican as defense minister. He replaced him by a Republican. Why we in, in the Sahel say, no, I'm elected. I don't move. It is very dangerous. Problem related to external intervention are for me the biggest threat, you know, because it attracts more activists. Uh, as in a way, I'm not unhappy the situation in, in Syria is continuing because it's preventing people coming from my region. Because a settlement in Syria, people will come to fight in the Sahel. And, and why not? You know, they, they, they move from one place and other. It attracts difficulties and addressing related problem uh, is very important. And, but to start blaming others is not, uh, is not enough. So what I, I would like to, to suggest to, to help the discussion, we should strengthen the overall cooperation between Maghreb and state, Ummah. They don't meet, they're exclusive. Everyone would like to have his satellite. It is not helpful. And the only country we are close to, French, US, uh, I, I don't think people will listen to them. 
And maybe the best is not to interfere. The Saudi Arabia has a good uh, image with all countries. So, but how you and how you organization, if some people are from NGO, could ask Maghreb and the state to unite their effort and work closely with the Sahelian and vice versa, and with the Gulf state. It is important also to help cooperation, not only between Maghreb and between Maghreb and ECOWAS and between them and uh, the Gulf state to strengthen local front, local political front. Uh, I, I think Ambassador will mention it, but in Niger, they have a system of consultation between government and opposition. And I, I think this can help. In Bamako, uh, they need to do something. They need, M my problem is the status quo is helping only the elite military and civilian. How to organize election in war is another problem, but we can devise a mechanism, election in the South, and to reach, I mean, we'll see it in the discussion. One last point. There was an organization called Sensad. It was created by Qaddafi, so people were in, but with a distance. I think we should not throw, how you call it, the baby with the water. And they met recently in Jamena, in Chad. I think we should help organizations like that if they can bridge the gap and give a space. You know, the same thing in Europe, they have what they call Mediterranean Union pour la Méditerranée. Is it possible for them to help? Uh, because it is more inclusive than just France, Spain, and Italy. And uh, so I would like to stop here. But one last point. War always brings business to a, a number of people. And they will not be happy after the end of a war in Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, you know, to go out of job. So they will encourage continuing crisis in the Sahel. And they can come from everywhere, from my own region, from our side. So war law is a reality. I, I, I get close to in Burundi, I get close to in, uh, in West Africa, I have seen in Somalia. I'm sure they are around in, in my own region, and we should not neglect them. War law, people who benefit from war, you know, like security forces. If there is war, it means no election. It means you buy more military equipment without check and, and balance because it is secret d'etat. So it is very interesting. Why do you have democratic election if there is civil war? So war benefits many people from within the region and from outside the region. <clears throat> we, we should not neglect that in trying to say, so Malian are stuck but we all are stuck with them. UN has a good representative, you know, Prodi, who has good experience. He has international experience. No one will close the, the door at him. African Union has Boyoya, military, civilian, with good experience. I think both of them can work together if we support them, and we should. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, these are a number of important ideas, and I hope you have captured them for our discussion. Uh, I would now like to invite Ambassador Burema, the permanent representative of Niger, to speak. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the floor. At the outset, I would like to sincerely thank IPI for the importance it attached to the matter relating to the Sahel region. As a matter of, fa of fact, it is not the first time that the uh, IPI organized alone or in cooperation with other bodies just as uh, the Center for Strategy in the, and Security in the Sahel Sahara region of uh, Ambassador Amedou Daldala, a think tank based in uh, Nouakchott, uh, Mauritania. Uh, to limit myself to a few of these important occasions, in which the Sahel Mata get due consideration on the initiative of IPI. I will recall the one held in this same room on September 
uh, on 7th September 2012, and uh, co-chaired by Luxembourg uh, through Ambassador Sylvie Lucas, who I would like to sincerely thank for his country support and uh, her uh, one support to the uh, issue regarding the Sahel uh, region. Uh, Co-chair also with African Union Permanent Representative, Ambassador Antonio Tete, who is not there today, but represented with, uh, by Sarah, I think, and uh, IPA. And the one recently held in my country, Niger, on the 15th and 16th of uh, February 2013. And precisely today, today's meeting, is for briefing on Nyame's seminar. As IPI and the Ambassador and Abdullah are more entitled and more capable to than me to make the restitution, as he already did, of the result of the event of Nyame, I will only uh, and briefly take, talk about our national strategy to deal with the problem identified in the region. This strategy originates from the program de Renaissance. Renaissance in French may be rebirth or renewal, uh, established by the President of the Republic, the Head of State, His Excellency Issoufou Mahamadou, in order to tackle the issue of security and development in Niger in general and in its Sahara Sahel part in particular. The strategy is called a Strategy for Development and Security in the Sahel, Sahel Sahara Zone of Niger, CDS Sahel Niger. It is this document. The overall objective of uh, this strategy is to contribute to the economy and soci economic and social development of Niger in general and the Sahara and Sahel Saharan area in particular by creating sustainable peace, security, and development condition. More especially, the strategy aims to ensure consistency with the diagnosis and meet the specific objective, the following five axes will be taken in consideration. Enhancing the security of goods and people, enhance, ensuring people access to economic opportunity, improving people's access to basic social services, strengthening local and communal governance, integrating returning from Libya, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and Algeria, because it's following to the event of uh, Libya in 2011, we got, uh, we got many of our country, our countrymen pushed back to, back home. For the effective and effective, efficient implementation of the strategy, some principles, an institutional anchorage, a control mechanism, an organizational management, a funding mechanism, and a mechanism for monitoring and evaluation are established. Uh, for example, the principles are transparency, participation, flexibility, subsidiarity, equity, part partnership, complementarity, and synergy. But uh, for the implementation, it requires a lot of money. It will cost uh, one one thousand two hundred billion of francs CFA, what equal to two point five billion of U.S. dollar. What is clearly uh, none that uh, is beyond of the capacity of my country. In, for this reason, we are seeking the kind cooperation of all our bilateral and multilateral partners, and for also the advocacy of all relevant institutions like IPI. 
For more information, I don't, uh, I don't have time to go deeply in the strategy. So the only thing I can say, I will provide a, a two, two copy of it to IPA. Maybe they can uh, make more copy for the other. So for more information, uh, you, you can rely on the, this handout. Thank you for uh, so, Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Ambassador, thank you very much. Ambassador Barame is going to have to leave in a few minutes, which is for another event, which is why he had to curtail his remarks. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of open this up for discussion. I jotted down a few phrases that were offered here, uh, unintended consequences of all these events, particularly you said not an intervention, but the French presence. You talked about thinking beyond elections, and here in the UN, one tends to focus constantly on elections as if that's kind of a uh, solution, whereas simply elections simply lead to another phase of situations. Uh, you urged a broad regional approach, and you made the point this was not just the Sahel region, but also the Maghreb and the Gulf of Guinea, so a much broader outline here. And then this whole question of what does an integrated strategy really add up to? when you have all these different players. So those are just a few thoughts. Uh, what I'd like to do is open this up to some questions, not speeches, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and have two or three of you come in. Uh, there's going to be a microphone if you would stand up and identify yourself uh, and uh, have a brief remark. The lady in front is waving her hand vigorously, so she will be the first, and then Maureen and the gentleman there, and then we'll come back. and. There are the four of you, and then we'll come back to the panel, and we'll have another round. So, oh, okay, good. Uh, please identify. Hi, it, it's Rhonda Halbin, and I'm a journalist, a UN resident correspondent um, for Tats.de, which is the Dita um online area. And my question is based on um, Ambassador Abdallah's statement of what we wanted here before Ambassador Burima leaves, which is what is the consultation mechanism that that you have going on in Niger? Can you say something about that? Because I, that was intriguing and I would appreciate, you know, at least hearing a beginning of that if you have the time. Thank you. Do you want to answer that before you? Yes, the consultation mechanism. Yes. The mechanism. Yes. Uh, okay. Position I can. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. yes, it is a a commission, a council, council called National Council for Political Dialogue. Yes, it regroup all the political party, elections, right? oppose the, the governing part and the uh, opposition part. They is, uh, uh, meet uh, on the, under the aegis of the prime minister of my country, and uh, time to time they meet to s solve any kind of problem, especially the one related to election, or if there is a, a political disp dispute, they get to get together and propose a solution uh, and if it's just f till now, f as far, uh, it uh, work uh, as well as uh, it can do. Okay. Noreen. Just stand up, Noreen, and let them all see you so everybody can sure. hear this. Sure. Hi. Um, Our I'm former Nor colleague. <laughs> I'm Noreen Chowdhury Fink with the Center on Global Counterterrorism Cooperation. My question is really to all the panelists, and it um, relates to two challenges I hear from everything you're saying, the challenge of sequencing and prioritization. You've spoken at length about a number of structural challenges that the Sahel countries are facing, development, governance, um, border management, a number of issues. But you're also talking about triggers and more proximate um, triggers of violence like the, the the conflict in Libya you know terrorism and, and things like that so how <clears throat> how then to sequence or prioritize um, what needs to be addressed first or, or how to package a comprehensive strategy so that it balances many of these structural drivers and the proximate triggers you've spoken about thank you the gentleman there very good please identify yourself 
Thank you. My name is uh, Abdullah Njai. I'm originally from Senegal and the Global Practice Lead for Environment for UNOPS. And my question relates to um, Mr. Abdullah, um, my name's Zek, um, mentioned several drivers, climate change, poverty, uh, corruption, etc., etc. And in order to prepare a strategy, it is important to identify which one of those drivers are perhaps the most critical ones. And just wondering, what is the role here with respect to natural resources management? Uh, with respect to two aspects. The first one is that many of the countries mentioned in the Sahel, the Sahara, are very rich in natural resources endowment, including oil. Can the question be that these resources are not being shared properly because you have a, majority, a, a minority in these countries benefiting from these uh, natural resources exploitation and um, the majority of the population is left out. And a corollary to that is that these populations have been subject to climate change impact for 40 years. The international community is like four decades late because the Sahel drought started back in the early 70s. So the degradation of resources started way back but yet these communities are left on their own. So for four decades, we've been trying to find a response. What role does how this all to play in, in the scene? Thank you. Thank you, William Verdone from African Views. Um, what, and this is a kind of a thread that uh, Ambassador Barima was spinning. Uh, what statistics, statistics do you have um, within the Sahel Sahara on youth between, say, the ages of 17 and 25, and what foreseeable opportunities do they have in either employment or in education? Thank you. Quickly, how to prioritize? You, you cannot. You, you have to try to address issues simultaneously because they don't come one after the other. So you have to address it. But do you have a capacity to address it? Because many priorities, uh, lack of resources, but also lack of organization. M my sincere conviction from my experience, home and abroad, the problem is not mainly or only a problem of resources. It is a problem of managing resources, of living within your own means. You cannot have $1,000 and spend 10000 So we have to, to do that. Quickly, resource oil. From what I understand, first, very few countries have oil. Mauritania has very small production, Niger small production. Uh, in, in active side. Of course, Nigeria is an exception. But there are resources in, in gold, in iron ore, in uh, so on. V they have a problem, of course, of management first. Uh, I am not convinced that recent agreements are well negotiated. And, and here is a problem. U U.S. Congress, for instance, had a very good law in July 2010. What's the name? Dodge, Senator Dodge, and whom? Um, anyhow, uh, a, a law forcing all quoted companies to indicate commission paid. We have to see when European Parliament will vote it, and they have not. But so Dodge and what Frank. Frank, Frank and Dodge. It, it is very interesting, July 2010. I, I really advise people to read it. It is very interesting uh, le legislation. But business is very smart. And you know, bad guys in our countries are also very smart. They managed to make their own legislation. For instance, instead of coming like a company from a regulated country, they come and they make it local legislation. So it, it opened the door to everything. Or they go to what Americans called white cattle, you know, individuals in, in some countries in, uh, who are not quoted. 
So it is very, very complicated, but civil society is making progress home and abroad, like Transparency International, of whom I am still on advisory board and fund. The youth, we don't have accurate statistics. We accepted, um, you know, response is that more than two thirds of the youth are in, in uh, two-thirds of the population are youth under 30. It is uh, accepted. Maybe it is more, maybe it is less. People think Africa has reached its demographic revolution, so it will stabilize and maybe go, go down. Meantime, there is a problem. When you have no hope to get a decent job, you cannot migrate. So violence has become a business, a social acceptability. You know, no, no, you, know, you have your gun, you have this, you know, people respect you, you have a nice salary. I, I think the radical in the Sahel were giving uh, 200 euro per month to people joining them, which is not bad uh, salary. And, and then you are socially accepted. You know, no girl will turn you around if you have your Kalashnikov, you have prestige, you have... So socially you are accepted. And uh, what, what to do, it is a real problem in all our uh, the Sahelian because we have not reached the democratic revolution. You know, because time constraint, I cannot... Yeah, that's okay. We're going to have another round in just a minute, so you all get another chance to ask some questions. Ambassador Lucas. Thank you very much. Uh, just a brief comment, because I think I was actually only supposed to make opening remarks and not a <laughs> panelist. That's great that you're here. In, in, in this respect, perhaps just on the question on, on sequencing or, or uh, if there should be prioritization, I, and I, I largely agree uh, with Ambassador Abdallah, what he said, that you have to, to do work on all of it. I think that's a, the idea of, of an integrated um, uh, holistic approach and strategy. Um, I just wanted to point out that, for example, the European Union strategy, which I mentioned, which was adopted in September 2011, and perhaps we have also not acted enough on, on this strategy. But there uh, we pointed to the fact very much in this strategy that it has to be this regional approach and that, you, uh, for example, reinforced security and law enforcement capacity has to go hand in hand with more robust public institutions, more accountable governments. And it spoke about also development processes, promotion of good governance, how you have to bring this together. And uh, it sets, um, uh, puts a, uh, really the focus very much on the coordinated manner of, of, of going, thing. not so much on sequencing, but that it has to be all different instruments have to come together. And I think that's also what we are calling on, on the UN to develop this integrated strategy. And also in this respect, and perhaps responding to a point um, the ambassador made before, where he was wishing that one should not only look at it uh, it's the Sahel, and but also that there has to be uh, not only cooperation between the Sahel countries, but also with the Maghreb and the West African countries uh, more generally. And for example, again, the EU strategy very much takes this approach uh, uh, because we, we felt that you know they are so intertwined, and so you have to look at it um, in uh, together. And perhaps one last point on the question on climate change and the effects of climate change, as you probably know, there is a long discussion going on, especially also in security council where. Some we feel climate change is not an issue which has security implications so on. But um, my country, we have very much felt, like also Secretary General pointed out in his report, that um, climate change, effects of climate change are threat multipliers and certainly have implications on security issues. And, and, and so I think it has to. That's why also um, I pointed in my introductory remarks also to this as one of the challenges, climate change, effects of climate change, uh, which the um, Sahel countries have to face. Thank you. Jeffrey, and then Shazia. Please introduce yourself, even though I know you. It may not be that every all single person well in the room here, does. No, no, not right. at all. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. Ambassador Ud Abdullah, you had uh, rightly called our attention to the kind of, I wouldn't say sham democracy, but the skin deep democracy that had been propagated and talked about how one needed to have the, the, the roots sunk deeply. And one thinks of Mali in particular, that until two years ago was being held everywhere as a model example of African democracy. And then it was overthrown in a military coup, which leads now to a two-track question. One is the role of the militaries in each of these Sahel countries. 
Uh, a, as are they unifiers across ethnic and linguistic groups? Uh, and do they help create a sense of nation? Or are they a constant threat to, to the nation's good governance? And then on the other side of that, in what do you all suggest in terms of inculcating a viable democratic kind of political system in which citizens actually are capable of making choices and ensuring good governance, and in this regard, particularly what the ex outside community, outside world can do. And Ambassador Luca, who heads one of the peace building commission configurations, may have some sense from that experience what it is that, in terms of good governance and democracy, the external community is able to help nurture. Very good question. So, Shazi Arafi, and then the gentleman in the fourth row. You want to stand up and introduce yourselves to everybody? Um, Shazia Rafi, Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Uh, very pleased to see you again, Ambassador Abdullah. We work together in Burundi. Um, I wanted to address this question uh, to all panelists uh, about the issue of what kind of sequencing and outside intervention could help deepen the maturity of a democracy. In particular, uh, one, I would like to say that, you know, um, I do believe that the process of an election is not just the election day. Uh, the international community, both through the UN mechanisms, um, electoral groups, as well as parliamentary organizations can help assist in the pre-election as well as post-election. And that, particularly in countries where there is so much instability, uh, would be extremely helpful. I know that in the context of Burundi, Ambassador Abdullah, when he had invited our organization and used to talk about it as post-election therapy. Um, it's, uh, and in the context of uh, this region and Mali, you know, both ECOWAS uh, has both a regional parliament as well as parliamentary groups. Uh, the Mediterranean has the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. And several global organizations like mine have both current legislators as well as former legislators who could be helpful uh, in connection with the UN's Peace Building Commission. So how can we uh, bring all these elements to work together to ensure that the process of democracy and peace can be strengthened. And both these questions really have to do with how can outside non-governmental organizations and so on contribute, as well as those who are leaders and, and local officials. So the gentleman in the fourth row there. Oh, thank you. Uh, Chris O'Donnell, I'm from uh, DPKO's DDR section. Just trying to get a jump on a question that's going to come <laughs> once we get involved in Mali. It's already come up with regard to the youth that um, are being recruited into these uh, armed, loosely organized armed groups. I think um, it was well phrased by Ambassador Abdullah that we're in a competition. I mean, they're given, they're being offered 200 uh, dollars or whatever uh, a month. And um, the question we're going to have is, what are we going to bring to the table? Now, what we often uh, have a problem with in DDR is that they say, well, integrate them back into the economy. If the economy is not developed, there's nowhere to integrate them back into. So we're trying to think of creative solutions as to what can we offer them? Because when the word disarmament comes, you can't go to disarmament with nothing to offer. And we can't wait for the economy, and, and we're talking again sequencing and time frames, we can't wait for the economy to come to integrate them back into, what can we offer? And it's, it's an unfair question, because I don't have the answer myself, and in every country it's different, but since we have uh, panelists here who intimately know the country, maybe we can begin to get some hints. Thank you. So uh, do you want to sort of take those three right now? Okay. okay. Thank and you. And we'll see. We've got, you know, we'll have another chance here. Well, uh, army is like, um, in our countries, army is part of a problem and part of a solution. Honestly, you have some countries where really you have professional armies, meaning recruitment and promotion are almost or professional, you know, based on education, based on experience, and I can give an example, which I, I know personally, it is the army in Senegal. Uh, I, I think people go through 
a good process of uh, education, and uh, most generally speak different languages, has been to high level school in Senegal and in France or somewhere else. So, but it is still a problem because in stability, there is a tendency to give advantage to recruitment based on the tribal, religious, or geographic. Uh, and, and, and that is part of, not part, is a big problem for the armies. Are soldiers going to die if they are not sure it is for a national cause? Uh, democracy, if, no, in, in addition, army are usually badly paid, even by, you know, people when they know they may die, I think something has to be done. And uh, I don't know. Democracy, but if, if, you know, everyone knows the church response about democracy, but, and I, I think it is still valid. It is bad, but the best of all regime. So we, uh, we, we have to take that into account. And I, I think personally, people like me have seen the advantage of democracy. I have known as a student a period where you cannot even talk. My country, we are nomadic. We have been always more or less independent because we are indisciplined by nature. And it is another. But generally, in the 60s, 70s, you, you cannot talk. You cannot you know, send a mail, you, it, you cannot demonstrate. There is a huge progress in Africa. Free press, free uh, travel, free speech, free... And in any case, no government can rain it down because of internet, because of mobile phone. So I, I am very optimistic on freedom in most sub-Saharan Africa, who, who are in addition small population. It means you cannot oppress and get away with it. Everyone knows it the next day. So, which is, it gives an, an extraordinary advantage. If you arrest someone or harass, the next day everyone in the neighborhood knows about it and starts yelling and telephoning. But the problem is, so we know it is a long process. The problem, as someone said earlier, to avoid for democracies what happened in Arab Spring. You know, just to say this is good, it's quiet, and puff, it blew up. Uh, we should avoid that. Second, as we mentioned in Niger, it is not enough to be elected. Because the fragility of a state, you have to try to be inclusive. Bring in a consultation or whatever, enlarge your base. Especially when we know elections are not necessarily transparent because there is no census, you know, credible census. There is no, you know, anyone in power have more resources to campaign. So one time of crisis, it is good to have a government of national unity and, and it, would, it will help. And this is where uh, democracy and yours can help. And uh, bringing parliamentary in together and, and uh, is always helpful. So, another point, development. Development is needed, and, and, and I share your opinion. Development, development cannot start overnight. I mean, the result, you, you will not get them overnight, but you have to start. And to start, in my opinion, but it is a long story, by job creation. Industries, which is infrastructure. Unfortunately, for the last decades in Africa, we have not invested in infrastructure, railroads, ports. We have been fighting poverty, which is good, but it doesn't create job. <clears throat> and, and this is all of us, the UN when I was in the UN, or World Bank when I was in the uh, World Bank, we were trying to, you know, to give food, not to create job. And, and this is part of a problem. But we cannot blame international institutions. We have been independent for 50 years. We have to assume responsibility and, and try to change. So this is what I would like to say. But on Mali, because I missed that point before, uh, one of the solutions, in my opinion, is to try to have a government 
with a united strong army and without a credible government who can say we do this or do that. It is very difficult and I have been advocating for a reconciliation within the army itself between the follower of the former president Traore, Musa Traore, who was stopped in 93, and his successor, General Atete. You know, as long as the army is divided, especially in Red Beret and Green Beret, while Chadian and French are fighting for them, we are going nowhere. But, so, that is what um, I wanted, uh, before returning to the floor, to ask you another question about a point you made in September and you have made again today, which is about the need to have a dialogue between the Maghreb leaders, i.e. Algeria, Morocco, and Libya, on the one hand, and the leaders in the Sahel. And as we all know, Mauritania and Algeria are not members of ECOWAS. So could you say a little bit more about whether any dialogue of this kind now exists? In other words, is there a discussion between these leaders? And if, and what's the quality of that? Or if there's no such discussion, and given the point I've just made about them not being in these institutions, of course they're here, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think can be done to really bring this kind of dialogue about? <laughs> I'm laughing if because it's a very tough question. And, and well, that's uh, right, very, I'm trying to think about it. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is tough, it is painful. You know, you have countries with the capacity to address the situation in the Sahel. Really, they do have a capacity. You know, Moroccan, Algerian have good army. They have, you know, compared to our countries in the Sahel, they have good resources. Gaddafi, because he is dead, there is no, you know, I mean, no usefulness, you know, uh, criticizing him or his regime. It is past. But most of the resources he had was to oppose Algeria in Mali or oppose Maroc in the Sahel and, and so on. But this is the past. The problem today, what is going on in the Sahel, in my opinion, is a threat to stability in Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Not only by radical coming from their country to the Sahel, they threaten Sahel, but in return, continued deeply rooted crisis in the Sahel will definitively affect the southern population of these countries. The same thing you, you see in Afghanistan, at the end, it has almost destabilized Pakistan. You, 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 you know, from what we read in the media, I don't know the region. Very often there are attacks in Pakistan and so on. So, but the two countries, especially Morocco and Algeria, are uh, cousins. It is family fed, maybe, or principal fed. I, I don't know, because I'm from the region, I don't like to talk too much about it. But, but I'm concerned, because if they make it together, it is good for us. If they don't make it, it is terrible for us. So how to convince them they cannot do it alone. You know, like my Algerian friends, they have something they call CEMOC, which is a military meeting in Tamaraset every six months, three months. They have not seen the crisis coming in Mali. They have not addressed it. They were not able to avert it. So why do you have this, this Etat Major group? Why don't you bring in Nigeria Morocco and Libya to pull more resources in to, to share and keep your fighting on Western Sahara, but freeze it and work together to, to, to them. Or solve the Sahara, it is an opportunity in fact to solve the Sahara. If French Americans try to help them, I think it will, it will exacerbate it even. <laughs> so, because these people also are brothers, but they are Mediterranean. Maybe they, they don't forget and they like what to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we should ask Italian to help them. Very good. I think uh, Ambassador Lucas would like to comment on Jeffrey Laurenti's question. So Ambassador, please. 
Yes, thank you very much, because I think there was a question directed on, on uh, given my background also as chair of the peace building configuration, um, uh, chair of the peace building configuration on Guinea, Guinea Conakry. Uh, but I think the issues are very much the same in the various configurations. And uh, actually, um, all configurations so for, for West Africa, and they have these issues coming together as priorities, um, which I think all the questions reflected, uh, one priority is normally of all the peace building configurations is national reconciliation and building up of democracy, um, consolidating democracy, um, where obviously elections play an important role, uh, but elections can also be, if not handled correctly, can also be divisive, as we know. And the whole process leading up to that um, um, and, uh, but it, it is an important issue, and their parliaments obviously have to play a big role also, traditional um, parliaments, they have commissions trying to work together, learn from each other. So national reconciliation is a big priority. Second priority, again, linking up to the question on military and the role of military, it's security sector reform. And uh, again, be it in Guinea-Bissau, in Guinea, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, and now uh, if we see uh, in Burundi um, and the African Republic, the six counties on the agenda all have an issue with security sector reform. Uh, we also have it in Mali now, obviously, and the DRC even. Um, so there is a whole issue on very much, um, as Ambassador uh, Udabdallah was saying, yes, they are part of the problem and the solution, and that's probably correct, but it, it, it has to be a so um, and uh, security sector reform. And again, this is linking up also to the whole issue on economy, because if you need security and stability in order, you know, to create an enabling environment also for the growth of economy. And, and um, third big priority, uh, again, of most um, PBC configuration, and for example, also for Guinea, Guinea Conakry, is, is youth unemployment, because, and youth, em youth employment uh, uh, addressing this issue, because, uh, for example, in Guinea, you have 65% of the population uh, qualified as youth. Uh, you have uh, huge unemployment there, no real perspectives while it is counter with a large natural resources sector, as, as you know. So we try, what we try to do is um, through um, training, working together with the World Bank, trying to also, uh, because one of the issues there is also that there is also no perspective because also uh, the whole education system is perhaps also not directed in the right, uh, um, uh, to the, towards the right uh, it's not opening perspectives, let's let's say like this. So uh, there are studies being done there, and then the attraction is always there to be, you know, um, drawn in by by the military and being recruited. Um, so we try to working on programs of training, uh, creating jobs uh, with World Bank and other actors in order to help make out of this huge potential of use a potential for the country and not a threat to the stability as such. But perhaps just to what well, it's very clear from all these remarks is that the same problems are virtually in each of these countries, whether it's in the Sahel or in West Africa and so on, which calls again for people to come together and figure out some kind of broader solution. So before I ask Yusuf Mahmoud to talk about some of the ideas that came out of the seminar on the way forward, where do we all, where do they all, where do we all go from here? You know, I'd like to see if anybody else here would like to ask a question, uh, and the gen or two. Well, no, no, it's fine. It's great. So the gentleman in the back there, and then the lady up front. Again, if you would be good enough to introduce yourselves, that would be. Her turn uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, I am from UNHCR. My name is Sanai Terefe. Um, the question I wanted to pose to the panelists is concerning the uh, ethnic dimension of the problem, um, and in particular, the issue of ethnic minorities. Um, uh, as we saw in Mali, uh, and as we see currently in the displaced population, there is a clear pattern, uh, it appears, of uh, 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 ethnic-based uh, discrimination. And uh, we see it in uh, the profile of the displaced population, uh, in the countries in the sub-region. And in light of that, and in light of other experiences, uh, as was mentioned, Burundi, um, the issue of ethnic minorities and their participation in the political process seems to be uh, a very much uh, a necessary uh, dimension to address. So the question is the following. Um, within the inclusive strategy uh, that is being considered, both at the UN and the AU, 
how is the issue of respect of ethnic minorities being addressed, in particular the Tuareg community? Thank you. That's very good. I, I believe the Prime Minister of Niger is a Tuareg to give you a very preliminary response. Please, uh, Madam. Mm -hmm. And, and Ambassador Old Abdullah will respond further, but you, should, you probably are aware of that, but I think th that's how you do it. You bring people in. Thank you. I, uh, my name is uh, Sarah Lawan. I'm working for the New Partnership for Africa's Development, which is the development agency of the African Union, and I'm from Niger. Uh, my question is um, that obviously, um, local strategies or local knowledge uh, exist or is being, uh, are being developed. Um, so I wonder what kind of uh, institutional platform you use uh, in order to disseminate this knowledge and or to uh, scale up, for example, this uh, Niger plan, uh, uh, the strategy of Renaissance. And um, second point, uh, are the existing plans uh, really taken into account? Uh, are they really they taken, are taken into, into account? account? Is the strategy of the yes. government of Niger being taken into account more broadly? Thank you. Right? Très bien. Okay. All right. So please. Okay. Uh, uh, quickly on. I will come back to one point we made on the military. Uh, I agree with what we said early, Ambassador and myself, that uh, they are part of a problem, part of a solution. In some circumstances, the budget, uh, the resources of a military, and it is seen in most countries, uh, when there is a conflict, it gives visibility also to, to military. So some of them might be interested in maintaining tension to ensure they have their share of the national resources. And uh, that should not be underestimated. It happened in advanced democracy. It happens more in our countries where the conflict is a reason to enlarge the budget. And in small countries, it is a big issue. You, you, you take, for instance, in, um, in the Sahelian countries, most national budget are between $1 billion and $2 billion. When in North Africa, the, the budget of defense alone is huge. From what uh, international uh, uh, peace, no, not International Strategic Institute, the London-based institutes will give a budget. For instance, when you have a budget of six to $7 billion, it, it, it is huge. Uh, compared to the Sahelian countries where, for instance, in my country, the national budget is hardly $1 billion. Uh, Mali, $1.7 billion, Niger, $1.2. So this is part. On youth, we are really advised to look into the website of UNOWA on youth employment, you know, in a few years ago. On Mali, you, you, you put a question, and in fact, this question of minorities. Minorities are part of all countries, mature democracies, but especially in our countries where they are part of a problem. I, I, I come often in conflict with those who said we have problem in Africa because the border were defined in Berlin without our presence. My experience, there are no borders who are natural worldwide, except maybe Japan, a group of islands. All borders are not natural. It is government through good policy, through inclusion, will create the nation states. And we have in Africa and in the Middle East to push to having you know, more inclusive government. And you mentioned the problem of Tuareg. It has been a problem since independence and in Mali. But you have Tuareg in Niger, you have Tuareg in Algeria, in Burkina, and in, uh, in uh, Libya. But they are not as acute in Mali for a number of reasons we don't have time to develop here. But quickly, one of them is you know, the rebellion in 62-64, you know, I think the management could have been more moderate. In addition, people oppressed were 
at the heart of Tuareg culture. And they were warrior, the Ifoqas. They are the basis of Tuareg, strong culture. The other are religious group and, and more moderate, but the Ifoqa will not accept to submit quickly to domination. And, and they have not, and I, I don't see them uh, doing it. So the real problem is really integration and reconciliation. They can do it for way many African and Latin American countries have done it. I, I hope it will do. On reconciliation, once again, you need a government. You need a credible government. And I really hope uh, those who are trying to help Mali, including France, insist on having a credible army with one person or group person who are able, American call it, where the buck stops, you know? You know, someone will say... We, buck stops here. Yeah, stop, buck stops here. Yeah, so if not, we, we keep in, 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 in anarchy, and it is contagious for all countries in the region. Thank you. So uh, thank you again very much. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Yusuf Mahmoud, who is going to offer the way forward and the wrap up. Thank you, John. Uh, to my contribution on the two points. The first one is what the comprehensive strategy for the Sahel should be guided with or by. Second is the way forward, how we're going to build on this. The first, <clears throat> the first, under the first point, the participant in the Niami seminar decried the shallowness of the context assessment and the context analysis in the Sahel. They were of your view that there is still more room for robust, healthy, dispassionate analysis that integrate the views and the experience of those who live in the conflict. They feel there was not enough analysis, and therefore the international community trying to help comes with cookie-cutter responses without understanding that transitional justice will look differently, that security sector reform would be differently done, that DDR will be differently done, and they have plenty of solutions and recommendations. They feel that there's not been sufficient effort for context-sensitive analysis. That's number one. So that's the first thing in any strategy. Have we consulted the refugees, the displaced, the women, the youth? And guess what? They've been meeting and throwing all kinds of declarations about their, how they view the situation, what the solution should be. So that's number one. Is there a robust, healthy analysis in that strategy? Second, under, as you know, any strategy will set up the context, these are the problem, provide the solution, coordination mechanism, the, the principle of cooperation. I'm not going to go about what a strategy looks like. But under the governance area, for example, plenty of issues have said. But two that I think um, retained our attention. One is that we must complement the juridical legitimacy that comes from elections with what they call consensual legitimacy and pragmatic legitimacy. Under... under Pragmatic legitimacy means to what extent the government is empowered and capable of providing basic services to the people. That's one way of earning that legitimacy. Second is, yes, you have won the elections, but have you created mechanisms for consultation, for dialogue? Dialogue and consultation as a governance function, not something that you resort to when you are in a crisis. And I think Niger is a good example, where they have a structure of permanent, they have a secretariat in the prime ministers for permanent dialogue. In addition to that, they added what they call le l'ombudsman, or le médiateur de la République, as they call it, which is constantly listening. That's one. Second aspect under governance, they felt that Citizenship is not taught. That is, citizens are not educated. There has to be a, a campaign for citizen education and involvement. And the reason this is done is to enhance the trust between the state and the citizen, because the state citizens 
are not trusted after a conflict. Third element is under the development arena, since any, any strategy will have to have a. They are of your view, because of the lack of consultation, there have been during conflict all kind of resilient mechanism that make people eke out a living, and particularly the youth. And they were talking about the digitalization of entrepreneurship with the cell phone. It's an unbelievable opportunity. Not all is it of it used for good purposes, and not all is it is peace friendly, but nonetheless, there is capacity. Um, so entrepreneurship, uh, and, and particularly the, the, um, the contribution of the local, the local private uh, sector. And that for, for in their view, this will help uh, deal innovatively with the youth component, which is, has double-edged. Another element that they felt a strategy should not wiggle around is how to deal with the drug trade and the drug issue at the local, regional, international. No one is going to f blame or find something. Another element, they are of the view that the Sahel problem is not only ascending northward because of the weakness and the porous border, and particularly will be ascending forward through Libya not to speak of the other. In fact, in my country, Tunisia, it's unbelievable the amount of arms and drugs that are transiting. And there is a fear that this military response, one of its, what did you say, Ahmed? Unintended consequences is the metastasis of these groups throughout the Sahel, whatever their mission and their aim. Another element is in every of these issues, we must not recreate or bring solutions. There are plenty of solutions in the South. South-South cooperation was very heavily uh, highlighted, and there are excellent examples. Um, as I just mentioned, and you will see when you study um, the uh, Niger uh, security and development strategy for its Sahel-Saharian zones, unbelievable ideas. Uh, that are already being practiced with the, um, uh, including how to use security and development to prevent Niger from becoming the next victim because the fault lines are still, still there. Last but not least um, element is finding in that strategy mechanism for strengthening intra-regional cooperation. There are plenty of organi organizations and mechanisms that reflect the division in that region, but really don't work together. And each has its own near abroad and mechanism for extended or projecting its power and interests rather than for working together. And they feel a strategy does not have suggestions for how to help these various mechanisms would not be a sustainable uh, strategy. Maybe one element that I forgot under, under, um, under governance we have met uh, during the meeting and in the margins of the meeting with a number of competent, vocal, committed women mayors in this, throughout the region. And they feel not only they have a good understanding of their issues, but as elected community members, they are only secondhand consulted. And they feel that this is an important element that should be um, so strengthening local uh, governance uh, was something that you, they have insisted on. I mean, th this is all will be published uh, as I will. Uh, uh, these are just elements in addition to what has been said that those who are going to debate the forthcoming strategy may wish to look, uh, to look into. On the way forward, five quick things. One is we're going to put on the website of uh, IPI and uh, the Center for S, the Niger strategy. It's, and you can always look at it. You can find it already on, uh, because it has, I believe, very, very interesting um, uh, and, and insightful uh, approaches uh, that would help adjust our usual prescription of the solution differently and adapt it to the context. And I think you might want to look at that um, integrated strategy. So the five things are the following. 
One is um, the Center for S and uh, IPI at the request of the local think tanks who feel they are not read, they, they have a lot of analysis, that the international community does not tap it, and they will come inventing the prescription of the problem, the description of the problem, prescription of solutions. And so we have agreed that we will uh, use uh, our respective organization as a catalyst, institutional mentoring, to bring them into a forum where they can bring their updated analysis of these various situations. There are five of them. Second, we have agreed with um, the Center for S, which has become in this area a crucial partner of IPI, to hold a meeting before the next General Assembly in North Africa because of the issues we've talked about. We don't know where. Um, Ahmedou will take the lead to find the host country because we felt that that is a missing link as the problem is ascending from the south north in addition to north-south earlier. We have also agreed uh, to organize and we'll be uh, doing um, a quick one uh, in next um, uh, April, a meeting on the Gulf of Guinea and the connection between the Gulf of Guinea and the Sahel. Third, we have agreed and hopefully with the support of our, our partners to organize next year in the Sahel region a follow-up to the meeting that we've just had in Niamey. Uh, th things will have been put in place, and therefore um, bringing the same think tank, the people who have seen the development of the UN uh, strategy and some of the elements. And then uh, last uh, point, um, as, uh, as uh, the tradition, there will be Monday, uh, a quick um, uh, meeting brief of this meeting, so you could go to IPI and get quick summary of what we just discussed. Um, and then uh, during next week, there will be a longer uh, meeting note. And then by the end of April, uh, hopefully you will find, we will have already the French text, but you will have a French and English version of the summary of the entire meeting in Niamey. So that's just by a quick way of sharing with you where we are heading from here. And since uh, John has gone and he warned me that he would be um, uh, going, and uh, since we promised we'll finish close to 2.30 or before. Um, we wish on behalf of uh, IPI and the Center for S, thank you uh, for, for coming and for your active participation. Thank you very much.